Speaking of occupations, our next speaker, um, who is hailing from Hawaii, is uh, I'm gonna try my best, Kavena. I'm I really think that it's important to learn to, to pronounce everyone's names. But we have Kavena Ulaokala. Kapahua, who is from Hawaii and is a member of Pe Aloha Aina, which is an organization dedicated to the restoration and the pursuit of um, Hawaiian sovereignty and indigenous rights. And I think it's particularly important he will be our last speaker for today is because for those who don't know, in June, we had the Rim of the Pacific exercises, which has been held every year since 1971. And this year it was held in Hawaii in that territory that continues to be illegally occupied by the United States. And of course, I think it's a very um, poignant example of the importance of trying to uh, connect ourselves across the region and how one region's occupation is at the detriment of the rest of the world, because we saw the participation quite strange in my opinion, of many countries who have no rim on the Pacific, including the Zionist state of Israel, who's been continuing their um, genocide of the Palestinian people. And so to allow for the occupation or continued occupation of Hawaii and the military exercises that are involved in the Pacific in its pursuit of containing China and undermining other regional forces that are fighting for peace is also a part of our fight to see this as a bigger picture that needs all of us to be involved because um as we say and i i'm i'm i've grown up in south africa and my political um work has been mostly in the trade union circles and one of the sayings we say is an injury to one really is an injury to all so we end with you kavena so over to you Mahalo. thank you for that introduction uh, again thank you everyone for having me here i'm kavena ulo kala kapahua i'm with huyo aina uh, we're one of the original Hawaiian independence parties that was founded in 1893 after the overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom by the U.S. military. Uh, just to kind of frame today, uh, our history for people who may not be as familiar with it, I want to start today by taking us back to the beginning of U.S. imperialism in Hawaii. Uh, and, you know, the U.S. has continuously over the last few decades and even century tried to use Hawaii as the next stage or as the gateway of it in its manifest destiny. Yeah. Um, and this all started in 1873 when the U.S. sent General John Schofield on a secret mission here uh, to scout out a new base for the U.S. military in the Pacific with the express goal of using that as a stopping over station to reach China. Um, and to and then, you know, soon after with the opening of Japan and amongst other things, the beginning of U.S. imperialism in Asia. Uh, and so this has really culminated in the perfect storm of um U.S. imperialism in the Pacific, you know, after after the designation of Hawaii as the prime candidate for a U.S. military base, they overthrew our government uh, in support of a cabal of sugar barons and other capitalist elites and established Pearl Harbor Naval, Naval Station, which is today the command station of the Pacific Fleet. Hawaii is one of the most militarized places in the world. Now, we, over, we host unwillingly tw over 12 major military installations, including, uh, but not limited to, the headquarters of the Indo-Pacific Command, which is the largest command in the United States military, uh, the largest training facility in the Pacific, Pohakuloa Training Facility. Uh, we host the Pacific Fleet, which is, again, the largest naval fleet that the United States has, and missile defense stations like the Barking Sands Missile Range on Kauai, as well as numerous radar tracking sites as the U.S. continues its pivot to Asia. But that also means in that pivot to Asia that started under Barack Obama, that in order to reach Asia, the U.S. must also pivot to the Pacific. And so, you know, the U European empires, ever since Magellan came through our territory in a very accidental manner, uh, the European empires have always viewed the Pacific as a playground and as a conquest. The U.S. in its pivot now is in trying to entirely restructure its fighting force in order to function within this vast expanse that is the Pacific Ocean. You know, the U.S. has always treated the Pacific as an American lake, right? They have Guam on one end, they have California on the other, American Samoa to the south, along with Australia, New Zealand, as was mentioned earlier, and the Five Eyes. Um, and the military that it built in the early 90s and just before that to oppress the Middle East is now realizing it's woefully under-equipped to confront the realities of an oceanic conflict as it tries to stir up conflict with China. Uh, we have a very large Marine Corps uh, base here called Kaneohe Marine Corps Base, which was established 
upon land that uh, it evicted entire towns from. Uh, they're having to restructure the Marine Corps by getting rid of all of their tanks because there's no point in having tanks on Pacific Islands because there's not a lot of room for them to go and it's very rough terrain. So they have to get rid of their tanks and restructuring as an island hopping amphibious assault force. Uh, they're deploying Predator Assassin drones, which are renowned in the Middle East, of course, for their drone strikes. Uh, they're st they're basing them here, despite the fact they have a range under a thousand miles, which means they're basically useless for pan Pacific travel or for inter island travel. Um, all to say is that you know as the U.S. continues to beat the war drum of the um, beat the drums of war with Asia, it's woefully underprepared for it, but it's rushing toward it in an effort to sustain its military dominance and its imperialist dominance, and to fund its military industrial addiction. One such way um, that I think Mika did a great job of mentioning earlier is the Rim of the Pacific exercises or RIMPAC, which just wrapped up at the beginning of this month. Uh, these are war games that are held every two years. They've been going on since the 1970s, uh, and our movement has continued to fight them every time because they're built upon stolen land, as I mentioned before. You know, the, they take place on U.S. military bases uh, and are engaged in massively destructive uh, conduct. It, what was mentioned earlier about the U.S. being the, one of the largest, the largest institutional polluter on the planet, we know it here far too well. Um, the U.S. has destroyed entire islands through its bombing in the Pacific, not just through nuclear uh, tests, but also in Hawaii. The island of Ko'olawe was destroyed, or it had its water table broken, meaning that it no longer can sustain fresh water due to U.S. military bombing, which was part of the RIMPAC games back in the 70s. Um, these games include 20, over 26 countries, 25,000 troops, dozens of surface vessels, submarines, aircraft, and amphibious fighting forces. And generally, they have been used in the past several years, especially as a way of saber rattling against China, uh, and also to train allied nations and strategies to be employed against the United States enemies, be they state or non-state actors. Uh, and these scenarios that they train uh, foreign nations and, and their own troops uh, is significantly important, I think, particularly to this group, because it's so well represented that our people tend to be the battlefields that uh, these these exercises are focusing on. You know, Okinawa and Hawaii have a very similar history, unfortunately, of the U.S. using us and polluting us. Korea was mentioned earlier as well. You know, um, in the 2022 RIMPAC Games, North Korea was the unofficial um, pretend opposition force during RIMPAC. They, you know, the U.S. denied that, of course, but then you know, in footage, uh, you can see Kim Jong-un's portrait in every single one of the houses that the U.S. military trained their units to clear. Um, and then even before that, um, the participants practiced uh, a counterinsurgency strategy against the Pacific Island insurgency movement. So they're preparing not just for a war in Asia, but preparing to confront indigenous uprisings here in the Pacific, like we're seeing in New Caledonia or Kanaki now that France is currently engaged in and is still ongoing. And I encourage everyone to continue to pay attention because there are still ongoing uh, uprisings there. Um, the U.S. has used RIMPAC to train a who's who of global oppressors, colonizers, oppressive and genocidal regimes, as was mentioned earlier, uh, not just the U.S., but Canada, Israel, Indonesia, um, and unfortunately, even nations that have condemned Israel uh, and have broken ties with them, such as Colombia and other Latin American nations, continue to partake in these things, even though, uh, again, some of these nations like Israel or other states like Brazil have no uh, Pacific border, but are still take, partaking in these games. Uh, and all of this, of course, again, taking place on stolen land. Um, and our sacred places are massively impacted by this. Makua Valley is one of the most sacred places in the Hawaiian Islands. It's been used as a bombing range for since World War II. Pohakuloa on the Big Island is over 100,000 acres of land, uh, and it's the premier training facility in the entire Pacific. They've done everything from airstrikes there to troop movements to using depleted uranium rounds. Uh, and, you know, these impacts are incredibly violent to our people. Not, you know, depleted uranium is not great for anybody's health, particularly if it's left up uh, uncleaned. And uh, there's a great, you know, there's great, doc there's great documentation of this, of you know, the U.S. does its bombings, it can, contaminates the area, and then leaves it, doesn't clean any of it up. So the next time they airstrike the area, it gets knocked up in all the dust. Um, but this isn't, you know, and it's not just these kind of uh, live fire exercises that continue to contaminate our areas, our, our land. 
Red Hill uh, it is one that's come up in the last several years. The U.S. used to have its premier fueling station here in Hawaii called the Red Hill Strategic Oil Reserve. Um, it was basically an under, underground bunker full of oil tanks that held over 280 million gallons of fuel and has been broken since they built it in World War II uh, and has continuously been leaking fuel since then. Uh, over 200,000 gallons has now gone to, into our drinking water and po in, in 2021 poisoned 93,000 people. Uh, I hate to tell you this, but they're still poisoning us, even though they, after months of sustained protests, we got the U.S. military to shut down the facility. They started cleaning it up. And we, of course, similar to Okinawa, have been met with the horrible uh, realities of PFAS, uh, the forever chemical that is now in our drinking water. Um, and, you know, the U.S. has not fully cleaned up our water, no matter what they say. They continue to try to make light of it, make it like it's over. But just earlier this past week, it, it came to light that uh, the fuel that leaked out of the facility has now moved in the underground aquifer to a new region and is now contaminating the water of a new region of the island. So it's an unfolding event. And I think also very indicative of where our future is headed, not just in Hawaii, but globally, as the U.S. continues to engage in these very short-sighted, detrimental, uh, problematic practices. And in addition to this, um, we need to think about the U.S., the impact the U.S. is having in the Pacific as a point of struggle, right? Um, it's The Pacific Islands pose no threat to anybody, except when they are utilized as uh, military targets by the United States. You know, uh, the U.S., no, no one has an interest in taking over Hawaii except for America. And now, because of that, similar to Guam, Guam has a lot of concerns about this. In a peer-to-peer -peer war or internation war, our islands, unfortunately, have become prime targets for um, other militaries because of the threat they pose to them. And this is the only time you get hear me give credit to John, uh, a liberal, but basically John Oliver put out like, on last week tonight, put out a great show uh, last week that I think everyone should go watch. It was focused on Hawaii. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because it focused on a really key issue that I want to bring to everyone's attention today, because I think this is going to be a defining issue for all of our movements, not just in Hawaii, not just in the U.S., but in Asia for the next decade. Um, in 2029, 40,000 acres of U.S. military land that was stolen by the U.S. military just after World War II and has been leased to the U.S. military for $1 for 65 years, 40,000 acres, it's going to expire. Uh, and this land, has the, the lease for this has never expired before. This is the first time. And of course, you know, this doesn't mean that only when leases expire, we can get land back. But it offers us a time to intervene on this process that's critically important, not just to Hawaii, but to Okinawa, to the Philippines, to China, to Korea, because so many of the premier military facilities in the Pacific under the Indo-Pacific Command are in this. Hoakula, the main training facility in the Pacific. There is no other place in the Pacific that the U.S. can train as many troops in as extreme conditions as they can at Hoakula. That is up for renewal. That is uh, up for lease. The Barking Sands Missile Range, one of the most state-of-the-art missile facilities the U.S. has in the Pacific region, that is also up for uh, lease renewal. Makua Valley, again, uh, a civilian town that was turned into a bombing range post-World War II, also up for renewal, um, including some of the U.S.'s premier jungle warfare training facilities on the island of Oahu and other radar tracking stations. Um, all of these are crucially important to, important to their strategies. And I want to bring them to everyone's attention so that, you know, globally, our movements for peace can be aware of this because it's so rare for us to have opportunities to confront imperialism in this way, to have opportunities to not just, you know, fight the, combat the wars that the U.S. continuously engages in, but to weaken them, to, to take away their ability to conduct such atrocities, to conduct such crimes against humanity, uh, and be aware that these are coming down the pipeline. How often do we have a chance to plan five years ahead, right? We, we ha so often are forced to confront things as they happen. The U.S. commits an atrocity. It does something. We have to react to it. Now we are gifted with an opportunity to plan, to strategize, to build coalition, to build with each other, to remove these from the car, the card deck that the U.S. has in its hand, and you know, remove their ability to put these in other places because some of these are just irreplaceable for them. Um, because and win or lose, this will define probably the next decade of U.S. imperialism as the U.S. continues to move toward conflict with China and with the rest of Asia. Um, these bases that are built on evicted communities, built on sacred cultural sites, built on incredibly critical uh, environmental regions, uh, super fun sites. It's 
it is not just a win for the Hawaiian movement for us to get some of our land back. Woohoo. Uh, even though it's probably incredibly contaminated. Um, but also because that's one less time the Israeli, the IDF can train on how to drop bombs on Palestinian homes. It's one less time that the U S can test intercontinental ballistic missiles that would have the capability of reaching China or Korea. Um, it's one less place that the U S can store its forces that will not absolutely in no way fit in any other Pacific Island, be they uh, Okinawa or Guam or anywhere else. It's, it's one less place they can host a fleet the size they do at Pearl Harbor because there's no other, um, harbor large enough in the Pacific for them to host such a size of a force. Um, and it's off an opportunity for us as Hawaiians to not just return our people to their homes, which they've been denied for over 65 years and prior to that, but also a chance for our people to return to their farmlands to make ourselves self-sustainable again, because the U.S. military has destroyed much of our farmland and we now import 92% of our food, uh, but a chance for us to reclaim so many of our sacred cultural sites that have been taken from us. Um, that are that hold such a key point, not just in our practices today, but in our cosmology of our 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 understanding of the world as they are. Um, and so, you know, the the scale of this, I want to make sure people see. And I know, you know, some of the people on here have been in communication with people in Hawaii, and their movements have been in solidarity with the Hawaiians for a long, long time. Um, and like I said, this this uh, moment for us is crucially important because it allows us to define what kind of world we're going to not just live in, but what, what kind of world we're going to pass on. You know, we have a chance here to really shift the balance of power um, and, you know, determine will they have their strength significantly reduced by seizing back this territory or will they have consolidated control at, in, as they march toward war? These are the stakes, not just for us in the Pacific, but for and not just for Americans in the Imperial Corps. But for Asia, you know, um, one of the things that we say in the Hawaiian movement is not we don't have just a responsibility for ourselves, for our ancestors and for our grandchildren and children to get free, to get our independence back, to retake control of our land and our sovereignty so that we may you know, perpetuate that and expel imperialist forces from our land. But we have a responsibility to everyone in the world whose lives, whose movements, whose communities are continually endangered and harmed by the presence of the U.S. military on our land and the way they use it to train and expand that harm to others, whether it be uh, West Papua, whether it be um, the Philippines, whether it be Palestine, whether it be anywhere in the world. And so, you know, we have a chance to really change the future for all of us and not just for us, but for those who come after us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think that's actually a, a great space to end, but I still want to give every speaker maybe one or two minutes if there's any kind of concluding remarks, but um incredibly important intervention and it wouldn't be a real gathering of political organizers if people didn't give you a list of tasks to do and what i heard from you kavena is that um since august 16th just passed and we're working towards august 16th in 2029 when the expiration of, of these different leases will happen it sounds like to me you've told no cold war that we have to have an annual event where we raise these issues and think about how we can build solidarity around this campaign to end those leases return the lands to their rightful inhabitants and the fact that this has global implications for those of us who are under the boot of U.S. imperialism across the world and whose oppression is directly tied to those of the people in Hawaii.